Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. Today, Craig and I are excited. We've got a new friend on, um, Brandon Moncrief, and he actually is the, uh, the founder, I guess, of, of Dent Appraisal. I know you kind of did it with your brother, it looks like. Brandon? Yeah. Brother, yeah, okay. Kevin. Okay, cool. So you got some co-founders. But you're in the market of obviously doing dental practice valuations. And the reason that Craig and I are excited about kind of unpacking this a little bit is because we always talk about how there's such a randomness, it seems like, to valuations. Um, and I like that I like that there's someone in the space like yourself that's that's directly focused on directly focused on this. It's a narrow lane and it seems to maybe give some continuity to the space where there doesn't seem to be much. So at any rate, welcome to the show. Um, I know that you, uh, we were just talking before I hit record. I know you've been on um, Mark, pa Mark Costa's podcast recently. And so we'll pivot in a little different direction because we share some of the similar, same users, I'm um, sorry, listeners. And, um, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, we'll, we got to pivot from there and create some new value and some new insight on the things you do. Maybe go a little deeper into some of the conversations that I'm sure Craig and I will, uh, will lead you down little rabbit holes. Yep. So anyway, Brandon, welcome, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. So tell me what was the genesis of starting Dent, Dent Appraisal? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I spent about eight years as a dental lender, you know, the past seven as a dental broker. And I, I think you touched on it. There just isn't a lot of consistency as well as in our opinion, um, there's a varying degree of professionalism when it comes to dental practice appraisals nationwide. So we wanted to create a resource where an objective resource where it wasn't uh, outside of Texas. It's not linked to a brokerage. There's no other motivation other than providing accurate, insightful valuations for dentists nationwide. So we wanted to develop a resource where uh, it was affordable and had all the information that a dentist would need to determine what their practice is worth or, or what a practice that they're considering purchasing is worth. Now, I liked how when I was doing a little due diligence on your website, I liked how you had two different tiers. It looked like one was the bigger package that was around, what, $4,800. That right. looked like it was the comprehensive for, you know, almost included forensic uh, accounting just for the sale aspect. Maybe not forensic, but the big turnkey package in terms of like uh, ultimate valuation. Is that accurate? Yeah. So, we, yeah, we have basically two products. We have the full-blown calculation of value which dives into all the normal appraisal methodologies, gives all the supporting documentation regarding how we derive value. Um, but we found that most clients actually go for the less expensive option, the opinion of value. The valuation is essentially the same. The, the end result, the number is going to be the same. But the opinion of value is more of a short form valuation focused on seven key factors that impact okay. value. Yeah. And so that's, that only runs about 900 bucks. And I actually liked how you were, you were saying that some of your customers actually use it as a metric to show how they're tracking, um, you know, year over year, even if they're not in the, in the market of, of trying to exit the practice per se. I like that as a, as a cool, um, how am I, how is the practice, the trajectory of the practice, is it increasing in value or decreasing in value? And I think that was a pretty cool, um, value add that you guys had. Yeah. I think it's just smart business to, I mean, for most people, it's one of your most valuable assets. So I think it's smart business to regularly check the value of that asset. And then we're able to pick up, especially if you're going through the financials, you know, trends in the practice, opportunities. We found, you know, embezzlement. We found all kinds of things that uh, can help doctors protect themselves as well as, you know, make changes for the better. So, Brandon, I've got the million-dollar question. I'm just going to jump into it. Sure. Where, where the hell did the 70% to 85% of top line revenue become the practice valuation? Like, oh, like, oh, that's what the practice is worth. Like without any regard to profitability, EBITDA, anything, where, where, where did that start in dentistry? Because it's pervasive. Uh, I think it, it started because it's uh, historically most dentists are not business people mm -hmm. and people love benchmarks. They love the ability to just, you know, apply a very simple metric or percentage of revenues about the easiest thing you can possibly apply to a practice to figure out potentially what it's worth. Uh, that's, that's, I think, how it started. And, and it's, uh, it's just an easy way to speak about practice value, but 
you're 100% right in your viewpoint towards it. Benchmarks are dangerous. I mean, two practices located next door to each other with the same revenue level could be worth, in our opinion, far different amounts of money depending on a number of different factors. And that could range first and foremost from profitability to patient mix to mix of dentistry, reputation, quality. Technology, equipment. Yeah, exactly. Equipment, yeah. technology. <clears throat> we literally sometimes are selling or appraising practices that are located within, you know, a mile of each other that have similar metrics from a revenue standpoint, but far, far different valuations because of all the other factors involved. Hmm. And then once we figure out why that practices are valued at 70% of gross, we should figure out why is it that specialists get 50% and GPs get 30. <laughs> Same thing. Dentists love metrics. They just love simple formulas that haven't been contested over years. I think from a, from a valuation standpoint on specialty practices, <clears throat> we're actually seeing pedo ortho uh, sell for more than general practices uh, because there's high demand and, and very little supply. And that's a bigger uh, consolidation. I know we're going off topic a little bit, yeah. but that's a bigger consolidation aspect right now in private equity and the roll ups are a lot more prevalent there. So there's more of a frenzy and that's why the valuations are increasing because there's, those are easier to roll up. Yeah. Since we're on the, so, sorry, go ahead, Brent. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, since we're on the subject of specialty, though, um, and you mentioned Peter Ortho, I could see why that is a, a great premium because it's it's vertically integrated. Yeah, I was say. Um, you don't have to slow the services down. I mean, how many times a, a busy mom is taking their um, son or daughter to get their brackets on, and they have a small sealant or a cleaning that needs to be done, and that whole appointment is ruined. So you have to literally go out you know, cancel your appointment, go to the pediatric dentist to come back to just resume where you were. So the efficiency is incredible there. But yep. tell me, since we talked about specialty, what are you seeing in other specialty practices? Are endo, perio, and oral surgery practices um, still committing the historic values that they have? Is there demand for them? Where are you seeing it going? How are you seeing it evolve? I mean, you've seen historically the practice values for those three specialties be lower than general. And I see that it's, it's still that way. And I think that's uh, a function of the fact that they typically still rely heavily on referrals uh, as opposed to the pedo ortho model has moved away from referrals and they self-generate uh, most of their, their patient base and their revenue. So uh, I also think you see in those three specialties that you mentioned, a lot of those doctors come out of their residencies very confident and competent in their ability to start a practice and grow relatively quickly. That may not always be the case, uh, depending on what market they're going into, but it's harder to convince one of those specialists to buy a practice than it is general pedo ortho. Really? It's interesting, because I see in, in oral surgery specific, I have a couple of buddies who are oral surgeons, it's, it's incredible their buy-ins, like when they buy into partnerships, how they're oftentimes, you know, seven-figure buy-ins, and it's like, you're just getting an opportunity to um, it's all, it's a very interesting model to me, the oral surgery model in particular, because I see these larger groups and the buy-ins in there that, that are just not, it doesn't equate in GP practice as much, and it doesn't equate into medicine at all. You know, there's no equal. Are you, do you see that, Pete? Um, no, I don't know. I don't. How, how about you, Brandon? What, what about you? you? Do you see that? With, I mean, with you see, you've seen some consolidation in multi-doctor practices. You're talking about some large oral surgery groups that have formed uh, around the country. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, the buy-ins can be substantial. The margins are also substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those practices tend to net anywhere from, you know, 55 to 65% of revenue. So from a, a profitability perspective, those practices are actually worth exponentially more than a, than a general practice. Yeah, but um, like you said, the, the success of them is predicated by the amount of referrals. And so correct. that in itself, in, in this, if we're talking about the movement towards, uh, you know, consolidation and roll-ups where they're keeping it in their own ecosystem, that makes them vulnerable, very vulnerable. So I see what you're, you're saying about how it's not as profitable, or I said the valuations are not as, in, as high as pedo ortho because of what I just said. Now, and, and when I'm talking about valuation, you really have to talk because of what's going on with the consolidation of the marketplace, private equity, the mm -hmm. focus on EBITDA. Uh, you really have to look at this in two different perspectives. You have to look at it from the doctor to doctor transaction mm -hmm. side because valuation is a little bit different in, in that arena as opposed to the private equity, DSO, consolidation, multiple EBITDA perspective. Mm -hmm. 
those are really currently two separate marketplaces. Um, so we have to look at the attributes of the specific practice and opportunity and try to figure out which, which marketplace is, is the fit. We may actually give two different values for the same practice. And, and then the owner can, you know, choose uh, which valuation they use depending on what type of buyer they're entertaining. So how often or what portion of your sales is from people looking to exit or sell the practice, sell the practice versus those looking to onboard a partner? A good question, Pete. Historically, Always. so if we look at <laughs> both the appraisal business and my brokerage business in Texas, uh, historically, most of the sellers have been people that are retiring. Yeah. Uh, that is not the case today. You're seeing more and more younger doctors take their practices to market because the management burden has grown exponentially and they're a little worn out from that regard. They love the patients. They, they, uh, you know, love their team. They love dentistry, but they don't love the headaches that come along with owning a practice. So you're seeing more and more people sell their practices to relieve themselves of the management burden. And then I think the younger generation is more mobile. I mean, they, they move around more. So you're sell, seeing more and more docs, hey, started a practice five years ago in Austin. You know, now I'm going to move to Denver, want to sell my practice. I'm going to start a practice in Denver. So the people don't stay in one spot uh, for their whole career as they did in the previous generation. It's, you know, I'd like to talk about something real quick. So you talked about the management burden. Um, and I feel like that's a narrative that is being um, compounded by, hold on, I actually have something right here that I got in the mail from even Heartland, right? And it's something I just got in the mail today. And it's like, you hear this. And I don't know if that's the narrative being like less stress, more success, late, <laughs> less late nights, less oh, under, that's cool. less, yeah. less risk, right? But Craig, did, in your in your father's era, that wasn't the narrative. It was like it wasn't that complex to run the dental office. That was you know. Well, I mean, listen, if you're selling anything, you have to sell the problem before you sell the solution. So Harlem's doing a really good job of selling the pro problem, like you know, like anything else. Like, are you are you finding yourself? But is it a problem or a self fulfilling prophecy? Is my point. Well, I mean, it's a problem. They're selling a problem. They're they're making a problem. They're like, yeah, I imagine I could leave work early. I mean, listen, everything's got its own pluses and minuses to it. So it's not like these guys sail off in the yeah. sunset with Heartland. Everything. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I just yeah. that, that was just something I was thinking of. No, but it's true. I I, I think that is is it a is it a real problem in dentistry? You know, or is it just something that like, oh yeah, me too. Like, I don't like that either. So I'm going to sell. And like, it's like, okay. And then here well, it, it, no, dentistry, buyers, corporate's dentistry like, okay, has, cool, sell to us, sell to us, sell to us. No, dentistry has become more complex. HR is more complex than it was in my dad's era. Um, right. Marketing, it was illegal to advertise. So you didn't have to worry about that. Uh, PPOs, you know, I'm sorry. PPOs, managed yeah, care. Technology. And, you know, I mean, look, when Pete and I talk, you know, and even at our summit, uh, you know, Pete, Pete's famous for saying this. He's like, you got to think of yourself as a digital marketing agency that just happens to do dentistry. That's an overwhelming concept for most people, including me. And I consider myself a fairly sophisticated uh, operator. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is a, a challenging landscape. There's, it's not like it used to be. All you had to do back in the day was just to have a place for the patients to be treated and do quality work and things grew organically. And then the advertising came in, the guy with the biggest bucks um, could win at that space because he could advertise more. And now the true meritocracy, you actually have to provide them with an unbelievable experience. Right. So now you have to do great work, do, have it technologically sound, and provide them with an unbelievable experience. I mean, that playing field is really high at that level. So Brandon, let me take this in a complete right turn. So what is, so we already said that the, the, the arbitrary 70 to 85 or whatever percent valuations is just, it's a little wackadoodle because it doesn't take into account all the aforementioned you said. What is, so it, are you guys going, at, are you pivoting more towards an EBITDA standpoint or are, is, is some of your valuation still subjective or what? Good question. So, I mean, when we're focused on the larger practice, 1.5 million or greater, and the clients potentially looking at what is this worth from a DSO private equity perspective, the focus is on EBITDA. Uh, 
if they're looking at you're saying 1.5 or greater you said that's when you start going 1. to 1.5 million or greater we encourage doctors with revenue of 1.5 or lower to sell to a private doctor why uh, <clears throat> because the multiple that the dso or private equity is going to pay at that lower threshold is not going to be significantly greater than what a private buyer will pay uh, and as many people know that have gotten into the scenario of selling to a strategic partner dso there's a lot of strings attached that come along with that premium they pay on the practice. So right. maybe they'll pay 10 to 20% more for the practice, but it comes along with the hold back, earn out, uh, you know, and a loss of autonomy and a, a lot of uh, potentially negative consequences. Yep. Um, so if we're looking at it from, let's say a doctor to doctor transaction, a traditional uh, practice sale, we revenue, is, is certainly a driver of value, but there's other factors involved. And we basically focus on seven key factors. That's revenue level and trends, profitability level and trends, uh, type and size of patient base, hygiene production and service mix, facility and equipment, location, and opportunities for growth. Those are the seven key factors that we look at when we value a practice. Okay. And the locational aspect of it is not only just is it you know retail visibility or tucked away in a commercial building it's also you know what part of the country is it in what city yeah. is it in demographics outlook too yeah. right like yeah. what does demand look like in that market is that economy is that microeconomy contracting or expanding kind of thing yeah exactly I see. so okay so what is so that helps in terms of the like the the 1.5 and greater should go look more towards an EBITDA versus okay that explains it so what are you finding that most practices if you had to just distill it down like what are most practices selling for privately versus private equity in terms of an ebitda standpoint so privately in more urban markets where there's high demand you're talking somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of revenue okay where you fall on that scale is going to depend on really those seven factors and how attractive they are when you move outside the urban market, when you get, let's say urban suburban, so 70 to 90% of revenue. And again, we're talking percentage of revenue because that's just the easiest benchmark right. to use. Um, not because it's necessarily the most accurate. When you move outside the urban suburban market to rural markets, it's getting harder and harder to convince, uh, especially young doctors to go to those markets. So you're talking somewhere between you know, 50 and 70% of revenue in the rural markets, despite the fact that the revenue and profitability factors may be phenomenal compared to the urban market. Um, from a, talking about a multiple of EBITDA on a larger practice, you're seeing practices with EBITDA in the range of, you know, three to 500,000 sell for anywhere between three and five times EBITDA. Okay. So three X to five X earnings. Okay. Right. Once you get, but that's above the 1.5 that you're saying those are that that's that 1.5 that you recommend. The reason, the reason we talk about 1.5 million and higher is you really don't typically generate substantial EBITDA until you reach that threshold. Okay. If you're under that threshold, you know, after you pay the overhead, a lot of fixed expenses, after you pay the doctor compensation, there's typically not a huge amount of EBITDA available to apply that multiplier to. So if you're doing 1.2 million, your EBITDA may only be, you know, 200, 250,000. When you start to look at that, you know, four times average multiple, you're only sitting around a million dollars. Well, private buyer will pay a million dollars for a practice doing 1.2 million. I see. So when you get up to EBITDA around a million to, you know, 1.5 million, you're going to push that multiple up. Okay, so it's best suited, you're saying it's advantageous for the person doing a million dollar practice to sell at the, the arbitrary amount because EBITDA is not substantial enough to create appropriate value. Correct. Got you it. will not get that exponential multiple you know, that you would get on a, a much higher EBITDA practice on a okay. lower EBITDA practice. Okay, makes a lot of sense, okay. So if you're not gonna get additional value then why would you consider if a smaller pra as a smaller practice partnering with, you know, DSO private equity? 
Uh, and then it comes into the pamphlet that you looked at, you know, earlier. Maybe it is that you want to give up some of the, the management burden and that you need infrastructure, you need support. The reality is you better be very, very choosy about which DSO you go with if that's what you're looking for, because there's a varying degree of, you know, support and autonomy out there. Some of them will come in, make you drink the Kool-Aid and change everything about your practice and make you miserable. Others are a little bit more hands-off and, and really, you know, act as, as a partner. And I will mm -hmm. say over the past few years, some of them have, you know, they've gotten their act together and there's been some new ones that are more doctor driven coming to the marketplace, smaller emerging DSOs that are more clinically driven than they have been in the past. Yeah. And that's good. I like how that's pivoting because, you know, for a while there, we were getting this brainwash that dentistry was broken. It needs consolidation and all blah, blah, blah. It needs DSOs. And it wasn't broken to begin with. It wasn't broken to begin with. It just wasn't like, um, and so, you know, the cottage industry wasn't broken. And I think there's this narrative that, that corporate <laughs> is going to dominate corporate's going to take over. What am I going to do? And like, anyway, Again, well, I think, I think when you look at what's broken, I think it's a Wall Street narrative as well. That's what I'm saying. They, 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 they say that this, this office should not exist because it's not profitable enough. But listen, the dentist is having fun. He's providing a good livelihood for the employees that work there, and he's taking good care of patients. How is that broken? Just exactly. because he's not at the benchmark. But speaking of benchmarks, I want to just ask one question. What's the average profitability that you're seeing um, for practices that are 1.5 and above, what's the profitability for question. your doctors are paid? What, what do you see that as a benchmark? Because I know everybody has a different view of that. 1.5 million and above, you should shoot for uh, a profit margin of anywhere from 40 to 50%. 50% is preferable because what you'd really like your EBITDA to be when, you, when you're operating a larger practice is 20%. That, okay, that, so I, sorry, net, net profitability, doctor paid everything. Net net profitability after doctors pay twenty percent should be the, the the mark that you shoot for. And okay. do you do you find that as practices grow larger and larger, you see that number expanding or contracting? Typically, it just depends on the growth cycle. You typically see that number expanding, which is why as you get larger and larger, your EBITDA tends to increase because your fixed expenses are are paid. And your economies uh, of scale, right? Yeah, like yeah, economies of scale, leverage. I mean, you're mm -hmm. able to leverage suppliers, labs. Um, you know, you tend to, to look more like the larger corporate practice from a financial standpoint, and you get the attention of the, uh, the industry, you know, people, and they tend to offer you better. Okay. Uh, so that, that does help. So, you know, so you're saying as an owner, as an owner, so meaning, what am I trying to say? If I owned an ice cream shop, I'm going to have an ice cream analogy, right? But I didn't work there, right? I, I could expect if I expected 20% profitability, that would be the same as if I owned dentistry, but didn't work there. That is correct. So okay, thank when, you. You, when you talk about- That was a terrible analogy. No, I think it's fine. Thank you for pulling me off the cliff. Yeah, I fine. think it's important to, to define what EBITDA means. And EBITDA means revenue minus overhead minus a wage to the doctor for producing that dentistry. Um, so- when Yeah, you that's, the big, about, that's the big wild card, by the way. that's the because, variable, yeah. right? Like what would be that- Wait. Well, if doctors actually paid themselves above the line, above their net profitability line, most of them would find out that they actually don't have a business whatsoever. They just have a job. Most would find that. That, that is correct. And that's why those practices under that 1.5 million threshold, there's value above and beyond just that metric because it comes with autonomy. It comes with the pride of being a business owner and the satisfaction of you know being able to do things your way. There, there's a value. It, for, for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have one, I have one more question actually too now. So what is the average payment up to the DSO that you're seeing after these deals are done? So like what's the average DSO taking as a percent of your, of your top line after you sell? That varies because there's different models. I mean, so, so many of the models are a hundred, you know, a hundred percent purchase. Like you mentioned Heartland earlier. The like Heartland the top line model, revenue, you're saying, right? Th th that means they, they're taking on full ownership of the practice. Yes, okay. And they pay the doc anywhere from 25% to 30%. Oh, their, I thought it was a very rigid, hard 25%. 25% is the guaranteed amount. And okay. then there's the ability to earn up another 5% based on uh, a number of different metrics that you won't know until you 
uh, get past closing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's explanations, but it's hard to, it, it's very situational and, and it's hard to determine what that 5% is going to look like post close. Um, because you have, you know, what changes are they going to make to overhead? What type of fees are you going to, is the practice going to pay back to the parent company for infrastructure and support? And that is what you asked about. That fee varies. I mean, it, it's anywhere from 3% to 15%, depending on how the structure of that actual DSO, what the, the service structure of the, the uh, parent company looks like. Um, it, that's very situational again. So it can be anywhere from five to 15% of revenue is what that individual practice is paying back to the DSO for support. And, and do you track um, either in a software or a, in, in a quantitative way, how your doctors are doing post DSO sale? Do you ever, do you query them back? Do you find, do you have any pulse on the industry of how happy the average dentist is after selling to the average DSO? It, it's hard. It that's, that's difficult to quantify because again, a, a, every DSO is different. Every doctor is different. Every situation is different. Right. So I mean, listen, an 80 year old guy that sells off to any DSO is going to be happy as hell because he's just converted his asset into cash. And, and Peter and I always talk about this. Uh, is it, is it an act of resignation? The way the current DSO model looks now, is it like pulling your effort card and saying like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to surrender my upside potential or are there arrangements where you're seeing people actually flourish and do far better because they did it? So you bring up an interesting point and I, I think you've got to talk about this because there is kind of a perfect storm that's been brewing out there for the, the DSO buyer. And that is that we have a generation of older dentists that are, uh, very emotionally attached to their identity as being a dentist and their practice. And financially, many of them haven't saved and are, are uh, able to have a uh, idle retirement. They need to continue <clears throat> to earn income. So, and a lot of them haven't evolved or don't want to keep up with the management, the marketing, the PPO involvement, those things that are, you know, you, you have to, uh, focus on in order to be successful or continue to be successful in private practice. So you've got someone standing there saying, Hey, you know, I'll give you a hundred percent of revenue for your practice and you can stay here and work as long as you want. That's a pretty attractive sell for a doctor. That's within five years of retirement. They can get a premium for their practice. They love their patients. They love dentistry. They can stick around as long as they want. And, you know, leave when they're ready to leave. Uh, hopefully, if they pick the right buyer, they're, they're going to be happy. Um, but it's hard to say. I mean, some of them have been absolutely miserable. And the day they fulfilled their uh, holdback obligation to get peace out. Yeah, the remainder <laughs> yeah. of the money, they're, they're gone. Um, others, you know, some of them have been there 10 years, but this is a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, you, all this consolidation has really happened uh, and, and got wings over the past few years. So I think it'll be a little while before it all plays out and you're able to really definitively answer the question that you asked regarding their post-closing satisfaction. Yeah, we need more I, data. I would just, data. I, and I'd love to see, I know we'll never, I, I know this is just uh, on a wish list, but I'd love to see what like the same store sales growth after, after being acquired by some of the larger DSOs. I wonder if your practice does better. You know, because the, the uh, I mean, hold up the You're pamphlet saying, again. Is there, is there contraction of profitability or expansion? Correct. I, I would yeah. just love to see long term. I mean, obviously, uh, DSO can come in and, and start saving a lot of cost because of the leverage supplies and stuff like that. But I wonder beyond that, if they're really helping the, the dentist do better. Well, right. Because of like, there's other issues here that, you know, we talked about like doctor happiness, Right. If that goes down, then profitability is going to go down. So, yeah, well, you may have offloaded some of these headaches and all this stuff, but like, you know, then you start having problems with team, the attrition of your team and culture gets eroded possibly. And the experience gets eroded because your core, you know, I see. What, well, it I depends how, but it depends how good you are. I mean, you know, you know, there's, if you take a dentist who's a low level operator, that's really struggling in so many different disciplines, but he's great at patient care, you know, and a merger with a, with a well, 
established DSO could actually add to it. I would just love to see on mass as a whole, because, you know, I sent you that article the other day, how I, I was shooting back and forth with Peter. And there was an article that we were talking about, maybe we could put in the show notes um, about like PE and, and it wasn't dental specific, but it was like how private equity oftentimes more often than not actually doesn't help industries. You know, it's not even about dentistry. It's like, you know, the, the consolidation of PE is not always what it's, what it's cracked up to be. Just to... Yeah, so see how we, we're going to take you down some rabbit holes. I, mean, I, bet, I bet this conversation was far different than your one with um, Mark Costas. All right. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked a little bit about, I think it's a hot topic, the, the yeah, PE yeah. And, and DSO, uh, the consolidation. I mean, there's just so much out there. You're getting mail from Heartland. So is every other successful practice owner in the country. I mean, you're just being inundated with it. So, I mean, this this topic has has come up a lot. Mm-hmm. And I, I think a, another thing that's important to talk about is we're seeing something that I haven't seen in the past in regards to valuation. And that is these elite premier practices are becoming with revenue of one point, let's say two million or higher are becoming more and more valuable and more and more marketable mm-hmm. from a private buyer perspective and a DSO PE perspective, uh, from a private buyer perspective, they're becoming more marketable because a lot of dentists have significant student loan debt and very, very high lifestyle expectations. And they need to buy a larger practice to support that debt and that lifestyle. So you're seeing those larger elite practices become more valuable and you're seeing the practices that are have revenue under 500,000 that are antiquated uh, become less valuable and harder to sell. So you're going to see a whole generation of practices that at some point are, are not going to be sellable. Um, and in our brokerage business in Texas, we're actually having to say no more and more. Wow. We probably decline a third of the listings that come across our desk. <laughs> Because and usually they fit those parameters of being either antiquated, lower enough revenues where it just doesn't make sense. So basically, yeah, like the their acquisition cost just doesn't make sense for anyone to buy. Like, oh, what they're paying a percentage of revenue too. So aren't isn't your brokerage business as a percent of what they're going to sell for? Uh, yes, it is. And yeah. you know we want to make sure that we're able to deliver on our costs. Yeah, yeah. And, and deliver on our our promise to sell a practice. I don't like things to just sit on the market. Um, but a lot of these practices have both issues. They're not only, not only do they have a low revenue threshold, many of them are declining. Declining, uh, yeah. Yeah, declining in revenue. And as we know, overhead doesn't go down over time. It only goes up. So it's squeezing cash flow significantly. For the seller, they may have been happy for the past year, five years, because even though their net profit has gone down, all their debts paid off and you know, they're at a very different place in life than a younger doctor that has 250,000 in student loan debt and, and is starting a family. Um, so because those two people are in very different places financially and in their career, it, it, it causes a, a impasse in the marketplace. So that's, that's fascinating to me that you're seeing a trend towards where really the entire valuation of that practice or the, is, is predicated on that doctor because the, the practice has no value because well, it's declining. Well, yeah. It's declining. It, the, the equipment's junky. The, there's no effort going into it. And so it's crazy to me that a practice could have a zero valuation, but I think that's, it, 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 I think it, that's, we're not there yet where, where those practices, but it's are. trending though, right? You're seeing trending. that trend. It's definitely trending well, that direction. Well, look at wow. goodwill. I mean, people, they don't value goodwill as much as they used to. I mean, there's so much effective messaging that, I mean, the minute people, people are too savvy for that. They're, they're too savvy to pay for goodwill and, and to show up and not see their doctor there and, and, and feel, have it feel differently. I don't think it's what it used to be. Brandon, since you guys have a brokerage service, how fast are you seeing? What's the average, um, I'm trying to give the real estate analogy, days on market um, that you're seeing a practice go for? Depends on, on, on the practice, but okay. I mean, if you're talking about an attractive practice, let's say it's doing 800,000, five ops, uh, technologies up to date, good location, good market. I mean, that practice, it, uh, we could literally make five phone calls and get a couple of offers. Those practices move very, very quickly, as opposed to the antiquated $400,000 a year revenue practice in a rural market. You know, it might take 
two, two years uh, to sell that practice. And, you know, going back to, to those small practices, Craig uh, touched on something earlier. And really when it comes time to talk about starting a practice, buying a practice, working as an associate, it all comes down to options. And if you factor in a wage to a doctor as overhead and you're not netting out more as a practice owner than you would producing that amount of dentistry working down the street at a corporate practice. Why does it make sense to incur that debt? And, and that's what's driving those decisions on those smaller practices. Yeah. Cause not only, yeah. Why does it make sense? Because also what I just mentioned, you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable in a whole lot of aspects, right? So you're, um, yeah, I see that. I agree with you. I mean, Craig, you've always been beating that drum with like, you know, making sure that the doctors, even we influence audit where they are. And if, it, you know, not everyone, quote unquote, it's like Gary Vee says, not everyone should be an entrepreneur. Not everyone should be a business owner. Some dentists should actually work for corporate. It would, their, their quality of life and fulfillment would be way up versus this. Well, not just, not just corporate, but work with, you know, listen, we all have strengths and weaknesses as human beings. <laughs> And the, the goal is in your career, like everything else, is to exploit your strengths and minimize or partner for your weaknesses. Um, so if you're an amazing dentist, but you just don't like to lead a team or you don't like to deal with marketing, then there's a myriad of options for you, not just yeah. corporate. I mean, and geez. that is the benefit. I, 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 you know, we always poo poo corporate and, you know, you know, sol a solo practitioner is always, well, not always, but that no. is one of the benefits. It gives options, just like you're saying. And I think that is cool. I mean, look, I could park my Invisalign production in your practice and possibly, you know, there are times in my own career and with overhead cycles where I could have taken my Invisalign practice and done a joint venture and said, Pete, give me 35 or 40% of what I do for my Invisalign. My life would be tremendously easier and potentially make the same money. It depends on where you're at with your, your business life cycle. So I don't think, you know, we, we, I think that there's a couple different thoughts that are kind of floating out in this conversation right now that the move to go to a DSO is an act of resignation. Um, I, I think that we, we, we threw that out there and, and I think that's a little bit overreaching and, and it's, a myth. it's a myth because it, it's just your strengths. I mean, the doctors in your practice are really highly qualified, Pete. The doctors in my practice are really high, highly qualified. They've chosen to work in, in our paradigm because they've done us, you know, a benefit and risk analysis. And it's like, you know, I don't blame them. I got prosthodontist working in my office that he's got a maid. I mean, I'm, I'm really honored that he's with me and it's awesome, but it's also really good for him as well. So if you're bringing some sort of leadership management, patient flow, ad advertising skill set, and they all, ha all they have to bring is the dentistry, that's really cool as well. I think it's, it's important that doctors, especially young doctors, are aware of the options available in the marketplace Yeah, and, and are conscious about the decisions they're making in regards to pursuing those options. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we get the phone calls as a broker a lot of time where I got one just the other day, you know, a doctor uh, opened a practice two years ago, borrowed $550,000. Um, they'll do 350 this year, not taking a paycheck two years in and going, you know, why didn't anybody tell me that this is potentially what could happen? Uh, and they were looking at potentially looking to sell and, you know, with $500,000 in debt and $350,000 a year in revenue, that's not really a reality. And those are tough conversations to have. So uh, I think mm. if you're going to pursue, whether it be a startup or an acquisition, be conscious of why you're doing it. Yeah, uh, such good advice, Brandon. And then be prepared. Yeah, yeah, like, be prepared to work really, really hard. And have yeah. a lot of self-awareness, like I was kind of saying. So I think you, I agree. What's your why kind of like, is what I kind of heard you say. Like, why are you doing this? What's your why for doing this? And have self-awareness. Do you really see yourself being the, the leader, the operator, you know, all those things that are going to be kind of the components for being, you know. That's, well, listen, that's, at, at the end of the day, we all have a personal vision for what work should be like. And I always said it, you know, before I built my big building and the, the concept I had, I always said my vision was to just, um, practice in this manner. So at the time I was formulating the plans for this building and this concept, if I would have met another person that I trusted and they were doing it, I would have gladly done a joint venture. I would have joined them. Like, mm -hmm. so it just, it didn't exist. So if all you're thinking is you want to do your own practice because you're really stuck on having blue walls and you really think that, you know, um, it, it, that's not a compelling enough reason to do it. We, we get, we don't, 
go through the storms, not because we don't have the perseverance, but we lack the, um, the compelling why that pulls us to the vision. So if you really don't have a compelling why and you believe that you'll make a little bit more money as an owner, God, man, don't do it. And that, I mean, I hope that you guys can resonate with that message. If you think it's about a little bit more money, because as an owner, you're going to get more money. That's really, money's a really shitty reason to do something. Because like, at the end, um, you're, you're going to make less money in the beginning, like to your point. And I had a conversation with a guy recently, a, a associate of mine told me to call this a buddy of his because he's really depressed and burnt out. And he's like, you know, I'm making so much less money. I'm like, well, why did you do, why did you open up your own practice? He's like, well, I thought it'd be for money, more money. And he was really stuck on that. I mean, it helped him understand that, you know, he's building value. And even though he's not taking home more money, his practice went from 600 to 900. So there's some intrinsic values built there. But money's such a poor reason to do things, yeah. I, I think. Yep, I, I, I agree 100%. It's, it's just, I, I've just seen too many people though recently do startups because the money's easy to get, it's easy to find a space, it's fun picking out the equipment uh, and, and furnishings, but uh, you got to figure out how to be successful once you get the doors open on your practice. No. Uh, and I will tell you that a lot of these, because there's been so much consolidation and so much increase in competition from corporate or, or even private practice owners opening practices, especially in urban attractive markets where dentists want to live, you have got to have some type of unique selling point. And we've seen a lot of uh, <coughs> practices that have actually moved towards a higher end fee for service model thrive and do very, very well, as opposed to the dentist that tries to essentially emulate the corporate model, sign up with every PPO plan, you know, go, middle or, or, or low end on the equipment and build out. And at that point, for patients with a relatively low dental IQ, how do you distinguish yourself from, you know, a doc in the box type model? So there's been a separation of the marketplace in that regard as well. We've seen a lot of high end fee for service, patient centric, clinically focused practices do very, very well and thrive because they've tapped into those patients that value what they do and uh, we've seen them, seen them do very well. And then we've seen the private practice that looks, emulates kind of what a corporate practice feels like. And they're going head oh. to head and that's a dangerous proposition. Yeah. Right, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, don't compete in that, in that arena. If you're gonna, you know, that they've got much larger budgets and paychecks. If you gotta differentiate, you don't wanna compete on their, their turf. Yep. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. As a, uh, what other, I know we've talked about a lot of trends and I want to be respectful of your time and, and, and wrap here soon, Brandon, but what are other trends? Maybe you could end on kind of what other trends and maybe some, some, some advice of what you're seeing from your side of the table to kind of the dentist side of the table. Can you kind of give some trends that you haven't alluded to yet and maybe some advice to um, just the industry as a whole from what you're seeing? Sure. Uh, I mean, as far as trends go, I mean, we've covered, we've covered uh, a lot of them. Yeah, you're right. Uh, um, as far as uh, advice goes, I think remaining conscious of your options and your trends in your own practice. Uh, I get calls constantly uh, from doctors that are potentially looking to go through a transition or sell. And the first question I ask is, you know, where's the practice located? What's your annual revenue? And I would say half of them cannot tell me what their annual revenue is. And that is extremely bothersome. So, you know, that's where a tool like then appraisal. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. So they will pick right. up the phone and they'll be in the market to talk to someone who's going to sell, but they can't answer the simple question of what were your actual revenues? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's so common, Pete. No. All those, I, had, I had several people from the Bulletproof Summit just call me and say, I, I would ask, I mean, maybe not their growth, not only they know their gross, but any percentages, any what's the percentage of your overhead? They have no idea. They have no idea what percentage of salaries, no idea. It's alarming. So, and, and typically I do know that when wow. those questions can't be answered, it's probably not good. Um, because if you're not paying attention, if you're not conscious of the metrics of your practice over time, you're going to have major, major problems. I, and I hope that by the time I get involved, either I'm involved, uh, Hopefully you have low expectations or I'm involved early enough to help 
course correct. guide you yeah. uh, in the right direction so that you start looking at your metrics in the years leading up to the sale and make the practice more valuable and marketable. When that's well, it's, it's, it just goes back to like, Greg, we talked about this a lot in the summit and, and Brandon, you may have heard this, you know, it's Pearson's law. And if you don't, you know, what you track obviously increases because your, your subconscious goes to, goes to work kind of focusing on it. But if you're not even focused on it, then how, how can you be expected to be in a state of growth? Right. Right. And I think that's what you're saying. And so, wow, that's, that's crazy to me. I actually, well, that's I when, that's solid. when you start to talk about the, the management burden as well there. Yeah. And that may be, that may be the perfect person that says like, yeah, I love that fam- pamphlet you've got. Like that makes <laughs> a whole lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so, they'll, go, they'll go to work on the 2% high supply. It's a 2% high profitability. Yeah. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you may balk at being offered 25%, but if you look at you, the, those two guys you were mentioning that are the guy that got in over his head, three sixty dollars and $500,000 worth of debt over the last two years, if he was just paid 25% of his collections, he'd be doing a lot better. Right? And your, bandwidth, in, there's, and there's, your there's, bandwidth increases for being able to spend more time. I do see that, meaning if you're not doing payroll, if you're not doing admin, if you're not doing this, you're not doing that, now you have a little bit more runway to actually work on patients more. So that 25%, you know, you get, you get more runway to do that 25% in time. So I, I, you actually can take home more. Sure. And, you so. know, Craig made, a, Craig made a good point earlier that you shouldn't open your own practice and buy a, a practice focused solely on money. But what I will tell you is money and, and doing well in your practice makes everything easier in regards to stress and how you manage your team and how you communicate with patients. So if you can monitor your practice, manage it appropriately, and make sure that you're taken home as much as you possibly can. Uh, everything else feeds from there. It alleviates that, that burden of stress. It alleviates stress in your personal life from a financial standpoint and allows you really to manage your team better and, and to grow and uh, be more successful in practice. It's a snowball effect and it can go the opposite direction. If you're not paying attention yep. to your metrics, the practice ends up running you you don't run the practice and you end up, you know, miserable. Yeah. I think, um, look, look at how this progression has gone. I mean, for, for so long, you know, our, our industry was infiltrated with the supply houses and the equipment manufacturers, it, even in our schooling, the way that ch- who, which chairs we had in our schools and which instruments we used, it was really just a sales funnel for the industry to sell to these newly minted dentists. So it was like, we go, we get out. And of course there's a, a willing and able supply uh, vendor. Let's go say, Oh yeah, let's, let's get this thousand square foot. And they have their own design teams inside these supply houses. And it's kind of a foregone conclusion that you should own your own practice. And that if you're not, you're not really, really making it. And then I think there's some shame in there. I think there's some shame for the dentist that, to come out and say, no, I don't, I don't really want to work in my own practice or something like, you know, or they have a different view of it all. So we have no business training. We get out of school. We, we typically get our asses kicked. We have no idea what we're doing. We're trying to learn dentistry because let's face it, four years of dental school is basically an introduction. That's the beginning of your learning. And if you, if you treat that as the end of your learning, you're really not going to be clinically exceptional. And then we have to learn business and that's really hard. And, and I think that they're just, the options are great that we have now. The fact that corporate is, is a part of our, um, of, of an option strategy for most dentists, I think is a good thing because it allows just more alternatives. You know, 15, 20 years ago, what did you have? You had the military perhaps <laughs> and, or private ownership. And even associateships weren't that common, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they weren't, a, they weren't around. You know, well, that was truly the the build it and they will come generation where you know you could start a practice and the the market was uh, in general underserved, so you you, right. know, you get a patient base going pretty easily. The, those days are over, um, so I agree that corporate has has its role in, in dentistry, and I've seen a lot of very successful docs use it as a stepping stone, as a learning platform. Uh, for them to get their feet underneath them, get real life experience, learn who they want to be as a dentist, you know, what they don't want to do, what they, you know, can take and emulate from that model and and go do it on their own when they're ready. If you, I just have one quick question, Brent, if you could have one more thing in the market, like what do you, what do you think is missing? Like, so you have, you know, these well-run smaller groups that might be, you know, like what Pete has, or maybe you could consider what I have. And then you have DSOs. 
what, what do you think is missing? What would be really cool that you could see in the market that would be another option for dentists? An employment option, I, I, I don't really see. I, you know, you're going to see, I think, in private practice, dentists start to move towards that group practice model where you have multiple private practices under one roof sharing a facility. Uh, you're going to see that that model start to evolve. I think dentistry has to head there from an overhead perspective and economies of scale perspective. I think it makes Are you, are you alluding to a larger single location or both yes. larger single location and multiple? Oh. A larger single location where there's multiple, uh, essentially, private practices operating, functioning as one. Um, I think you're going to see that. I think that model makes sense. But I think you have to be aware that from a transitional standpoint, when it's time for one person to step away, you know, how does that function? Um, and I, I, those larger multi-doctor practices that are set up in that that solo group uh, fashion right now, a lot of them have thrived for 20, 25 years. The problem arises when it's time for one of the four docs to step out and how you transition that practice within a practice. The, the other thing, uh, stepping back from like employment options or ownership options <coughs> that I'd love to see, for private practitioners, education and, and the business aspect of it is so exponentially fragmented as far as how you guys are, are able to gain knowledge following dental school that I, I think that's a problem, a, a problem that doesn't have an easy solution. But I mean, there's literally a different dental seminar or what have you every single weekend across the country, if not three, four, five, every week, even in, in different markets. I'm in the Austin market. There's like two events, uh, CE events here a week. Uh, if, if that could be more centralized and there yeah. could arise some type of authority in the industry, maybe some type of business curriculum. Well, that's uh, what DSOs are doing is a lot of DSOs are doing that. Oh, absolutely. They, they've internally built uh, a platform to educate their doctors clinically and from a business perspective, yeah. the private practitioner needs that. Uh, yeah. So if someone were to build that and it be widely accepted and, and uh, supported by the general dental community, I, I think that would, uh, that's a necessity for private practitioners to be able to thrive from a business perspective moving forward. And if that doesn't happen, you know, I think doctors have to be very, uh, conscious and, and selectful about how they spend their time and money on CE. You know what the funny thing is too, we meet a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are out there that are actually lecturing, whether it be clinical or management. And it's funny, they don't have, Pete refers to as the chops, they don't actually have that success in their private space, um, which is wild that you're, on, you're getting paid big bucks to speak on how to do it. You don't actually do it yourself. Well, it's like been there, never done that. Like, well, yeah, how can exactly. Been there, never done that. I like that. I'm going to steal that from you, Pete. That's mine. You know, it's crazy, right? Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, it's great guys like you that have large successful practices doing things like this. It does make an impact on the industry and uh, it is fascinating. You know, we sponsor a lot of dental events and we see a lot of the same people that are very highly regarded at these events. And then we get the phone call to evaluate or, or sell their practice. Yep. They have the longest resume you could ever imagine. Yeah, and they're doing $350,000 a year in yep. revenue. It's like, yep. whoa, you know, That's you're like the, the guy that everybody looks up to. And I, now I'm looking at you. I, you know, I was excited to come see it. And yeah. now I'm like, what is this? Yeah. What kind of joke show? Yeah. 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 yeah it's yeah. crazy. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. And we see that all the time. We see that all the time. It's two separate domains. You can, you can have that resume and be great. I, I, or maybe it's like a coach versus a player. I mean, there's fantastic coaches. I mean, Tiger Woods' coach can't play like Tiger Woods, but he can make Tiger Woods better. So, I mean, maybe, maybe it's that type of thing too. Maybe it's our own judgment. Or I think own. in a lot of regard it is. Yeah. Cool. Well, Brandon, I, let's, uh, I want to close, but I actually want to make one more comment. I'm looking at your website a little bit more in depth now. And I do lo I love your seven factors that influence profit, uh, that influence valuation. Cause I think it gives, um, I think if someone would even look at that, 
that's not even interested in selling, like go to your website and actually look at that and say like, these are the things that should be on my radar, right? If I'm looking to increase profitability, these are the things that I should be focusing on because one day someone else is going to be focused on this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I do like the fact that like, I think it'd be, you think everyone should probably get a baseline of if they're really in the growth mode, you get your 895, uh, uh, maybe you can offer some of our bulletproofers a little, little code here, pal. But everyone should form the baseline for maybe getting that the uh, the eight ninety five report that gives the opinion evaluation, just so that you yeah. could you could quantitatively analyze you know where you are now versus maybe okay I'm gonna do it again in three years and like what have I done, right? But I think that in itself that in itself would create that you get what you focus on, you get what you focus on. I think that in itself would create accountability for yourself that you would say hey. In three years, I really want to impress Brandon, who's going to do this report and watch what's going to happen in my practice kind of thing. Yeah. You know, maybe that's just the way my weird ass brain thinks. But um, no, I think that I think that's actually but it, it, what it, you it focus creates on. accountability, right? It creates yeah. like a little bit of accountability. Whoa. It creates a little bit of awareness. Yeah. Getting excited, Petey. <laughs> it does. That happens when you slam your slam your desk. Um, but anyway, man, <laughs> I, uh, I. I appreciate what you're doing uh, in the industry. I, I'm glad to see that you uh, you guys are, are doing well, and 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 your product is very easy and clean. You give kind of two options, and and it's um, I like that. I like it's the uh, it's kind of the uh, what am I trying to say? Like that, not the dual. In, we call it dual close in dentistry, where you really only give kind of two options and don't paral don't give uh, paralysis by like this myriad of options. But I like what you're doing. I like um, you got a good business model, man. So I wish you the best of success. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, thanks. And thanks also for what you're doing. Uh, you're really looking out for, I can hear it in the way you speak and what you're doing. You're really looking out for the profession. So we all appreciate that. And thanks for uh, paying, it, paying it forward. Absolutely. All right, man. Have a great day. All right, guys. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you.